Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me and I'm solo today. Christine Watkins is off, but I am super excited to chat with Dan Burke, who I adore. I follow a lot of his stuff. I have learned so much from him. We are going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation talking about discerning spirits and also all of the other beautiful spiritual formation activities he has in his ministry that I know personally because I'm a member of his Sojourners on Apostole VA. I want to welcome everyone from the radio land out there in Radio Maria or those who are streaming live on radiomaria.us. And stay tuned. Hopefully this is recording okay. Usually it's Christine that does the recording on her side. And hopefully this will be on YouTube because I know there are thousands of people that will be loving this program because who doesn't want to discern spirits? So Dan, thank you so very much for spending some time with us today. You are a busy guy. Why don't you tell the world a little bit about what you got going on in your ministry? Well, God, God be praised. It's, it's wonderful to be with you, Kendra. I uh, love your enthusiasm. It's a time where we need light in the church, and I, I can already tell that you you do that a lot. Uh, you shine a lot of light, so thank you. Praise well, God. I, uh, you know, as you know, I, I was the president and COO of EWTN News, and I resigned last December. And I resigned uh, in order to give my life more fully to the core of my calling, which is what you've experienced, and that is helping the people of God come to know him and to live out that reality uh, in the world. And, and I think uh, somewhat inspired by St. John Paul II's call for the new evangelization, which he noted be, has to begin with the people in the church. And um, so the Catholic Church has been a, an amazing gift to me and and I love it. I love everything about it. I even in, I even came in you know, I converted in 2005, and I came in in a time of darkness with uh, uh, another scandal a little different than the one we're dealing with now. But, well, actually, they're connected. But anyway, the point being, it's the true church of God. That doesn't mean everybody in it is part of the true church. We have imposters, but we have good people like you, great bishops and priests that I deal with all the time. We just had a class last night at an Apostle VA on John of the Cross, and uh, one of our employees is also part of the community, uh, grabbed me this morning and said, the class was so amazing. We had a bishop and uh, Father Ignatius, and uh, who's a, who's a Dominican, I hope I got his name right, who's a Dominican priest who's doing the class, and uh, Father McDonald, who's, uh, who's a diocesan priest in New York. And they're all going back and forth, excited. and then a sister piped in, you know, there's 70 <laughs> people in the class. But, I mean, that's what we do is... is is our we form people in uh, over 70 countries bishops priests laity on the authentic mystical tradition of the church and that's the real answer kendra i know you know this i i, I don't know you well but i just sense you you totally get this that is what we need in the world what's going to solve the unrest what's going to solve our own lack of peace what's going to heal what's going to restore what's going to advance the kingdom of god is is drawing near to Jesus in and through the church that he established. And that's what all the work we're doing is about. Amen. And it's beautiful. It's if anyone's concerned about, oh, I'm not, I don't know the Bible chapter and verse, and I don't speak the the Catholic language because I've been on the journey for seven years. And I remember first learning, reading the catechism and learning the language. It is kind of another language, to be honest, um, but it's a beautiful language. And once you learn it, you it, it becomes you, it becomes part of you. And so I went from a person who didn't need God in my life for 42 years. Um, I wasn't going to any Christmas or Easter mass for decades. I was very detached. The world raised me, money, 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 power, prestige, pleasure. And then God pulled me out of the pits of hell. And now I'm a daily mass goer. I love the sacraments, reconciliation every week. And when it came, the rubber met the road for me. I really wanted to learn how to pray 
because I didn't have a clue. I wanted to learn how to hear God's voice, to do his will, and then, of course, discernment of spirits. And I started, I think, a little early in my journey, jumping into Father Gallagher's book. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of gave up halfway through because it just wasn't it wasn't setting in and I didn't have that daily mental prayer life every single day at that time. So God kind of put the put the stops on me there. But once the COVID shutdown came, no mass, no sacraments, I knew about deliverance. I knew all the weapons that I had available to me, but for some reason I fell into this, this week. I want to say it was probably six days of craziness. I was all the, all my speaking engagements were canceled and that fills my cup to meet new people out there. And I was like, okay, Lord, this is your will. I'll just go closer and deeper with you in my meditation, my Christian meditation. And I'll add another, you know, 30 minutes. We'll do an hour and a half together every day. And I was all excited. And as you know, the minute the, you know, Satan knows that we're ready to go deeper with God, he come pulls out all the stops. And so it's still Lent. My Lenten sacrifice was to have one meal a day, and that's big for me. I'm, I'm a bit of a eater. <laughs> that, that's been my, my focus. It's my temperance. I know that's an area I need to work. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm eating everything in the house. And I am like, what happened to this, you know, this Lenten commitment? And then I am plagued with exhaustion, and I'm so tired. I can barely keep my eyes open watching mass on my laptop. And then my prayer was filled with distraction. So by day six, I didn't know what, I'm like, what is going on? Clearly, Satan is working overtime during these times of fear and division. He's dividing everyone and causing rifts all over the world, especially here in our country. So I got on my knees and I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but can you please help me? And I hear, not audibly, uh, but in my heart and in my head, he says, hey, you're not using all the weapons I taught you to use. And it occurred to me, oh, I haven't delivered a spirit away from me since this started. No wonder what's going on. Oh my gosh, that's it. So I think we all need to remember it's a daily commitment to God. It's a daily walk and discernment of everything. And it's to use the tools that he taught us and not just keep them in our holsters, right? I felt like I was at the gunfight with a knife that week. And I finally said, ah, okay, you gave me the bullets. I have the guns. I'm ready to go. Sure enough, I went through my deliverance prayers for those spirits that I felt were attacking me. And I felt light and airy and peaceful. And I, I went right, I ran to adoration. Thank goodness. It was not an adoration chapel, but we still had some churches that were open, just not offering public mass. So I think that, um, this is going to be exciting for the viewers and I'm going to not talk anymore. Uh, but because I want you to share some tips and tricks about how you can discern spirits. And by the way, your book, was awesome because that very next day I remembered. So I stumbled upon you. Um, I, 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 you were, had an umbrella and you were walking in the rain and you were taking a, a video of yourself. And I was like, who's that guy? You know? And so then I watched another video and somehow I must've downloaded something where I got on your email list. And I remember seeing a couple of your Divine Mercy radio shows, which is on EWTN with your lovely wife, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. God bless you. And it said discernment of spirits, part one. And then a couple days later, it was like part two, part five, part 10. And I was like, huh, maybe I should listen to those. But at that time, I just let it go by. I didn't. And then during that time of COVID, that first week, I went back into your archives and I pulled up all of those mm. um, episodes and I listened straight through. It was like binge listening. I have pages and pages of notes in my Word document. And that was when I heard about your book, Spiritual Warfare and the Discernment of Spirits. So tell us a little bit about why you created that, uh, because I want to thank you for it. It yeah. was perfect for me. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned Father Timothy Gallagher, and I must say there are two priests in our time who are doing the absolute best work to advance the wisdom of St. Ignatius in its pure form. And uh, Father William Watson is one with Sacred Story Institute. But then Father Timothy Gallagher, who's not a Jesuit, Father Watson's a Jesuit, 
but it's it's a little ironic that Father Timothy Gallagher is is not a Jesuit, but he's advancing Ignatian spirituality more prominently than any Jesuit I know. But he uh, is a wonderful priest. He's doing so much good for the church. The challenge was is that his his book on discernment of spirits is very thorough, but it's also for our culture and time a bit thick, uh, a little bit slower of a read. It's a lot of detail. And I really wanted to build a bridge because to get people into this realm of understanding how to discern spirits, how to fight the spiritual warfare that's normal to every every Christian, authentic Christian that has a pulse, uh, to <laughs> teach them how to fight and to lead them into deeper water. You, and I will say, so you stumbled into a series I created after the book so that people could kind of be involved in a conversation. So just if I could make a side note, and maybe I can also mention at the end of the, our, our time together, but uh, for those who get the book, Spiritual Warfare and Discernment of Spirits, it's available through through our website, spiritualdirection.com. Hey, hold, hold up that book for those that are on sure, YouTube sure. so they can see the cover. Yeah. So there's the cover. It's and also it's, an audible book, by the way. Is it, it audible? It is, yeah, I did the recording. I'm sorry about that, but ah. it is, yes. I'm, I, you would have done better, I think, or my <laughs> wife, you know. But um, so then we created this free mini course that you actually took on, I think it's what you did, looked at on apostoliva.org uh, for people who want to dig deeper and kind of listen to a live conversation about the book. There's seven hours of uh, video in there yes, that I people did can that. grab to. So apostoli so. SpiritualDirection.com to purchase it. Apostle VA, you can become a member. It's free, and then it's in the courses area. So okay, so let's spell Apostle VA because okay, there right, might be yeah. some people like what? What? A P O S T O L I V I A E dot org. Really, just like it sounds, it's Latin. It means Apostles of the Way. It's a community. Um, okay. Orthodox. Our commitment is to do what we're talking about here. Advance. Uh, the mystical tradition of the church in relationship with the Lord. So, so to answer your question, my goal was to say, you know, so many people are in anxiety, so many people struggle, and this is not the will of God. You know, Jesus said in the Gospels, and this haunted me as a young Christian until I really figured it out. He said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. But my heart was deeply troubled. I came out of abuse, which I talk about in the book. And I had a deeply troubled heart that where I couldn't find peace. And so for decades, I memorized scripture, wrestled with these realities. And then finally, God be praised, I made a ton of progress just through scripture. And then I became Catholic in 2005, and then eventually discovered uh, Father Gallagher's work and the Ignatian tradition. And though I'm Carmelite at heart, you know, in terms of how I understand prayer and the, the whole of the entire life, the, uh, the interior life, we, we teach and, and use a lot of Ignatian spirituality because our time is particularly dark. The enemy has more power than normal. It's just an, an ebb and flow. And it's a, it's a disciplining by the loving hand of God to say, hey, wake up. And so... I, the best way to wake up, the best way to fight, I think you already get it, is uh, through the wisdom of St. Ignatius and the wisdom of Scripture. So that was the background behind why I wrote the book. And it's it's very straightforward. It's not a lesson, a school lesson. It's not a textbook. So yeah. I think people should give it a shot, especially those who have not read any other books because yeah. I think it's it's perfect for those who are serious about taking a, a deeper walk on the path staying even more in the narrow path and and realizing the fight I think today as we as we're in this time and I know all times were were stressful and had evil and good I feel like evil is manifesting itself and coming out in ways that I would have never imagined I've always understood that there's evil and good, but the evil goes so deep and, and is so apparent now that what advice do you have for someone who is struggling, right? It's that peace, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. So how do people find it as they are being bombarded with 
messages through the news. Um, maybe it's their family members. As God said, I did not come here to bring peace. I came here to divide mother against father and yeah. son against mother-in-law. I'm sure I'm not getting those uh, exactly correct, but that's the deal. And we are called to be disciples. We're called to make disciples, but to do it with peace and love and facts and the truth. And the truth is Jesus and Jesus will set us all free. So Amen. any advice that <laughs> that you have for for the listeners and the viewers? Yeah, I mean, uh, the number one thing would be to to know that it is not God's will that you be live in anxiety. Uh, it is not, you know, a lot of people will, will and say, yeah, but it's a tough time. And yeah, but it's, you know, you're, you're oversimplifying or you're, you know, Pollyannish. And I'm thinking, well, no, I was on a ventilator. So I know what COVID does. Uh, nine out of ten people die where I where I was. Uh, they don't they don't survive. Um, you know. So I've been in the storm in the church. I, I you know headed the largest Catholic news agency in the world. We broke the first Vigano letter of the scandal with McCarrick. So we were working behind the scenes. I knew it was coming. We broke it. So I. You know, I, I have no illusions about the difficulties we're facing. But uh, the message I want to send is that St. Paul wrote the, uh, wrote the uh, letter to the Philippians from prison, okay? But from prison, he said, so all of his rights have been taken away. The only right he retained, by the way, was to be treated, uh, to not be, um, have all of his skin removed and to have a, 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 a Roman trial before Caesar. That's the only right he had, right? So he's in prison and everything's been taken away as nothing. And he's writing and he, and he tells the people of God, he says, you can have peace that passes understanding. You can have peace that, that there is no rational answer about because when you know what it means to draw near to Jesus, when you know what it means to be permeated by his grace, by his love, by, by the Holy Spirit that he gives to us, then you'll know that peace. And I would say this is a time where if your cage has been rattled and you don't know that peace, there's one of two things is going on. One is you're a good Christian, good Catholic, but you don't know how to fight. So that's why I wrote the book. Two is, you're not an authentic disciple of Jesus. And I don't say that as a judge. I, I'm not judging. Anyone who knows me uh, or watch, has listened to me at, at any time, you know, I have no illusions about my own brokenness, my own weaknesses, all of that. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. <laughs> right? Daily. This is not, as you mentioned, Kendra, earlier, this is not a, 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 a battle and it's over and I've won and I'm good. The battle of being a disciple of Jesus is daily. And if you're not in, all in, you're not in at all. And if I could just say that again, if you're not all in, you're not in at all. And the reason I say that, not to judge again, is because I want you to be all in. Because if you're not all in, you are going to lose the battle. You are going to be taken to hell because the only answer to our, the problems of the world, the flesh, and the devil are found in uh, union with Jesus. And union with Jesus, of course, comes through the sacraments, through reconciliation, through, through, frequent, conf through frequent Eucharist, and all of that. It comes through daily mental prayer, but it also comes through fighting when we must fight. And this is a time like no other and I, I never, you know, when I, I've studied and taught Sermon of Spirits for years, I've only this last year said, been so strong to say, if you don't know this, you're going to lose the fight mm -hmm. and you're going to be a casualty to the degree that you know it and you practice it every day. You're going to rise above it. You're going to be a light. You're going to know the peace of God and you're going to be a light to others and help them. And I've, I've never been that strong, but I think the times demand clarity they demand uh, uh, those of us who understand just because God is more merciful. I, I, I consider that I, if somebody thinks I have more graces, it's just because I'm more broken than the average bear. So I, 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 I hate the idea of being put on a pedestal or being like, you know, 
I, I'm some special person. All I am is someone who was deeply broken in my childhood, who needed desperately to know the one who, the only way, the one who could heal me. And in that process, he's taught me and given me things. And he said, now you give them away freely, you've been given freely give. And that's, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. That's okay. I got complete God bumps. They are no longer goosebumps. It is God bumps. So the Holy spirit moving in me when you said daily and you kind of screamed it out there. And I, right. for the, for, for those who are on the radio, I put my hands over my mouth and I kind of giggled because when I first started practicing mental prayer, it was hard. It, yeah. it, it required a lot of time and energy, but I was, I was committed and it was <laughs> the book of Matthew. And all of a sudden the word daily, pick up your cross daily and follow mm -hmm. me. I use this often in uh, my talks as an example of what the living word can say. At that moment, it was daily. It mm -hmm. jumped off the page, slapped me in the face, and it was what I meditated on all for the rest of my, you know, half an hour of meditative prayer, mental prayer. And I thought, okay, daily, 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 daily. And then when you, when you, start your day with mental prayer, I truly believe you must wrap yourself in the armor of God and the love of God first thing before you go face the world. I know we some agree. people, some people do it at night. And I'm just like, it just doesn't, I, I said, if, if one day I don't pray, I know it two days, my husband knows it and those around me know it. And the third day, the world knows it. And it, there, there's no better way than to start it. And, and I can't start it the right way and have it be a God-filled day if I don't. But then all of a sudden, when you start, when you say living discerning of the spirits every single day, it means stopping, pausing, reflecting, and praying through these tiny decisions, these little temptations, these these things that come up. It's not, it's not always as clear as, oh, I know good, I know bad, I'm going to choose the good. It's <laughs> if life was like that, we, you know, we would never not do God's will if we honestly surrendered ourselves to him every day. But it's somewhat between those two good decisions or we're trying to discern a life-changing event in our lives. And can you talk a little bit about some help helpful ways for some people to to pray their way through these things in their lives. Um, let's let's start with two good things because I think that's the that's a tough one is really discerning God's will in those cases. Well, yeah. So in Ignatius, uh, this isn't in my book, but the temptation of those who are devout uh, changes. So the first fourteen rules, which are in my book, are to help someone get through what we understand as the the first phase of spiritual growth which is the purgative way. So there's three phases, the purgative, illuminative, and unitive ways. In the purgative way, the first set of rules is the most powerful, though Though desolation affect, flicks those later. What, what happens later, though uh, very common, is that if you're devout, you're, daily, you're practicing daily mental prayer, you're, on the, you're in the center of the narrow way, what the enemy then begins to do is tempt you with temptations of light. So St. Paul talks about this, right? And so does St. John of the Cross, where the enemy is uh, attempting to get you to do something that is good, but that is not God's will. So like for someone like you, the the major temptation would be, uh, and I don't know anything about your life, so, so folks listening, don't impl don't don't think I'm <laughs> revealing anything, that I, so I don't know anything about, about Kendra beyond, you know, what we've talked about today. But the is that uh, you're a very dynamic person, you're, you're very clear and articulate, you're very energetic, you're, you have a contagious kind of joy about you, right? So what's going to happen is you're going to get more and more speaking requests, right? And, and, there, and every speaking request is an opportunity for good, right? But you also have a primary state in life, which isn't speaking, just like me. My primary state is husband right now, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have my, you know, I'm empty nested. So my primary seat is husband. So, so I have to be careful that all that I do in ministry doesn't detract from my primary state. So I have the good of my duties of state, which are being a husband and make sure I honor and love and take care of my wife and you in the same way uh, with your spouse. 
Um, but then if we get, if we take that one more request, because man, there's going to be a stadium and it's going to be amazing and all of that. And yes, I know my, my spouse is heading into the hospital, but she said it was okay. <laughs> right. right. So that's when the enemy is really starting to do something that's very destructive. And so that's a great example. Now, how do you discern those things? I, I just gave you the framework. You have to understand the priorities. It's not, it's not, a, my wife speaks beautifully about this. It's not, you know, she was, a, a, I was, I was um, near terminally ill even before COVID from my own, my regular struggles. And I had been out of the hospital and she was doing dishes one day. If I think I get the story right. And she went, because she always had in her mind the way she kind of lined up all her responsibilities are, I'm a principal, you know, on a horizontal plane. I'm a principal of a Catholic school. I'm a spouse on a horizontal plane. I'm a mother, you know, and I need to take care of all of these things. And God said, no. He said, he said, you need to get, you need to flip that list vertically. You're a child of God, number one. It's your primary concern. Number two, you're a spouse of a husband. Number three, you're a principal. And the Lord said, and your spouse needs you now more than he's needed you before. So it's time for you to quit your job and go help him and work with him. Because who knows how long he's going to be around if you're not helping him stay alive, you know. And so that, when we understand the, our state and then we're... And then the enemy proposes another good thing to do. We can compare it against our state and say, okay, no or yes, depending on how it affects our state. So Father Gallagher, I might also say, wrote a book on this called, um, oh, what is it? So it's on my desk somewhere, Con Spiritual Consolation. I don't recommend it unless you've been practicing discernment of spirits at least for a year unless you've been practicing daily mental prayer for at least a year, you'll be deeply confused. But if you are in, in that realm and these are the kind of temptations, then uh, that's a great book, uh, Spiritual Consolations, to pick up. And I love that you bring resources from all areas to help people. And I really do feel very aligned with what you're doing because I am Carmelite at heart. My spiritual director is a priest who I actually met in confession. Awesome. Um, I know I, I thought, okay, this is Jesus putting him in my way and we've been together ever since. And he said to me once that I think can just piggyback on Stephanie's because I'm, I'm a wife as well. And yeah. my husband isn't praise God. You two are both holy, you know, there you're walking the path and my husband is not there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I know he's on a path, but it's not yeah. exactly my path where I'm on. So I pray a lot. Um, he yeah. knows that I go to daily mass. He knows I have time for prayer. So he respects that. Um, but my spiritual director said, and he's trained in Ignatius spirituality. So that's why I find this very, very complimentary. He says, don't have your husband be jealous of Jesus. Yep. Huge. And Right. And that was one of the things that stuck with me. And because there are times when I am praying before he comes home and I the, the garage door goes open and I hear it and I start like, oh, I got to go make dinner and I got to put you away, God, for now. And then I remember, wait, let's not waste this. I'll offer this as a sacrifice. This is my right. calling. I, I right. go go love my husband to death and so it's um it's I love that example. And we are going to have to take a break right now. Uh, for those of us who are tuned in, we've got a moment of pause. But when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about discernment of spirits and some other examples that can help you on your journey. Thank you for joining Dan Burke and me on Find Something More, Find Your Way Home. We'll be right back. All right, and we are back. It's Kendra Von Esch, Find Something More, Find Your Way Home with Dan Burke. And we are talking discernment of spirits. But but also about mental prayer and how critically important that is. And those of you who follow me know that that is my passion to help you deepen your relationship with God and the beautiful Catholic faith. And mental prayer is not negotiable. We're all called to be saints. 
St. Teresa of Avila says that the second level of the nine levels of prayer is the gateway to all the other seven. And who doesn't want to be climbing that path and that ladder to the perfect union with God? And oh, by the way, if you don't pray a mental prayer every single day, St. Alphonsus Liguori says that you cannot stop sinning. Hello. But St. Teresa of Avila says that if you do pray mental prayer every day, that this that Satan knows that he's lost your soul. And we talked about starting the day in the morning. I go back to wisdom where the manna fell down from heaven and they all went out in the morning and they picked it up. But when the sun came and rose, it disappeared. Yeah. I think, I don't know about you, but I think there are special graces when you start your day with the Lord and there's nothing cooler Although in the summer, you got to kind of get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to have this mm -hmm. happen. But to watch the sun rise and watch the beauty of God's creation come to life in your prayer and your reflection. Um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I, I just want to emphasize what you said is dead on target. It's funny. One of the holiest guys I know, I, I have a small group of guys I meet with on Sunday night. It's a private thing. Most of what I do is public. But um and he's one of the holiest guys I've known. Uh, no, I've known him for a long, long time. And uh, I've uh, over the over time occasionally poke at him because he prays a lot, but he doesn't pray first thing in the morning. But he also struggles with anxiety. And so I can't remember what the impetus was if I poked him again or something happened. But he came back <laughs> and he said, Dan, he said, Dan, I know you've been telling me this for years, but I just started instead of praying at night, I'm praying in the morning. And man, it, it sets up my days so well, and the Lord is with me, and I'm not struggling as much, and I can't believe it's taken me this long to 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 uh, to do this, and thank you so much, you know, and he's, so he's just going on and on. And so the funny thing is, is so when I give spiritual direction, or I meet people who are, you know, people of goodwill who want to learn these things and, and live these realities, when somebody says to me, well, I'm a night person, by the way, I'm a night person. OK, so I get <laughs> this. But but I, I don't that doesn't control me. OK, Th that's just my my inclination. I go mm -hmm. to bed at 830 and get up at four. Contrary to my nature, because it's better for me spiritually rather than doing what I'd rather do, which is follow all my interests and my awakeness at, you know, that starts to come alive before I go to bed. But anyway, so uh, where was I? So I was saying, so what I found is what you found and that, and what he just, oh, this is where I was at. So when people say to me, uh, I want to start at night because I'm a night person, I always go, fine. And because I just want him to start, you know, because once right, they right. start letting Jesus in, you know, he's, he, he always follows an invitation. He never fails to follow an invitation. And if you let him in a crack because he loves you, he's going to wedge the door open. You know, you can kick him out. That's true through your sin and, and neglect. But, but then I know if they start to pray, eventually they're going to have the exact experience that my friend had, which is a, a revelation of, wow, you know what? I, I got to get my compass right first so that I can navigate through these difficult waters all day. Back to your Old Testament analogy, I'll give you another one that's that's uh, beneficial to that. I, w I call it first fruit. So in the Old Testament, when the Jews were to offer a sacrifice to God at the beginning of a new harvest, they would always take the very first blessings of the harvest and give it back to the Lord, whatever it is, a portion of it. Mm -hmm. So I always use this principle of first fruits. You've been given a brand new day. You've been given however many hours you're going to be awake. It is a gift of God given to you so that you can know him. You can love him. You can know his love. You can be at peace with him. You can tell the world about him. You could do good by working and doing whatever you do to support your family or the, or society. Um, but offer that first fruits. It's transformational for a really holy guy. I have no doubt that his spiritual life is now going to go on another accelerated path because now he's starting with the Lord. Now he's beginning with this perspective of God's in control. I'm not the master of my de destiny, the captain of my ship. God is. I'm yielding to him first. I'm so, and I, we always say this in Apostoli Via, you know this, one of the 
phrases we use is all things for God begin before God on our knees. Mm -hmm. Before God on our knees. It, it, it's not a, it's at the beginning. You know, it's this idea of you don't, you don't start to serve him and then pray later. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. It's like, I don't, I don't drive my vehicle and then fill it up with gas. I fill <laughs> it up with gas and then I drive my vehicle, right? Because yeah. otherwise, what fuel are you running on? You know, and it's not going to be the best fuel, it's not going to be the, you know, in terms of the wisest fuel, it's not going to be the Holy Spirit. It's going to be me wrestling with all the principalities and powers and my own demons and the war demons of the world and all of that. So so I can't emphasize enough. And I wrote a book called Into the Deep, Finding Peace of Prayer, where if we're just like this book on discernment of spirits, if you've never done it before, the one thing I always try to do. Somebody the other day, a wonderful priest said, I see you as the Scott Hahn of the mystical world. I tell you, I am not that. <laughs> Scott Hahn is a scholar. What I am is someone who is very human and practical. Mm -hmm. And so Scott's awesome, by the way. I love Scott Hahn. He's a wonderful human being and a good friend. Yeah. But, but he writes at very much a scholarly level. What I do is try to boil all that down to, okay, what, what is the regular guy or woman do, or a college student do when they say, okay, I need to get nearer to the Lord. I need, what do I do? That That's where I come in and I say, okay, here's exactly what you do. It's not complicated. Anyone can do it. And and uh, that's what we need right now. I, I had so many people want the Lord, but there's a million books and hard, you know, and they're all too thick and too complicated. And they are for another time. But when you're starting, usually the books that I write are for that audience. Amen. Now, I remember uh, sending over, it was an audio file of a free a couple, a couple of Scott Hans talks to a friend of mine who had left the church. And she's very uh, versed in the Bible. But she says, I don't know what he's saying. I listened to the whole thing. And I was totally confused. And I thought, yeah, you're probably not there yet yeah, for him. Yeah. But once you are, he's um, just phenomenal and brilliant. And I always, yeah, I always grab a, a new something through, I should listen to him again. It's been a while. Um, his fourth cup was just an amazing mm. talk that I, that I think he's got a book on that too. But so that is the difference. I think that is why I really was so jazzed to have you on the show today is because you do speak just plain, plain language that is applicable to how everyone on the journey, no matter where you really are, um, one of the things I thought was fabulous is your, I don't know what you called it, but it is a chronological line of what books you should read when oh, during yeah. your, um, during your spiritual walk. And that was, I mean, I'm like, oh, I watch, I, I remember that because you said, um, St. Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle, if you read it too early on your journey right. and you're not practicing mental prayer, it's going to be like, whoo, right over your head. Right. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of the other books, because how many have you written? Let's I edited, well. written, or co-authored or authored, I think 15 or 16 okay. by now. I'm sort of losing count, but the I want to tell people what you just mentioned, because I think it's very uh, fun for people, too. If you go out to apostolivie.org, A-P-O-S-T-O-L-I-V-I-A-E.org, um, and just type in a search for what Kendra just mentioned, spiritual reading plan. Now, it may require you be a member. It's free. Don't worry about it. Just go in and create your little profile and then type in spiritual reading plan. And it has uh, the purgative, illuminative, and unitive ways, the three phases of spiritual growth. And then it has books recommended for it to navigate that uh, journey. And I updated this thing just this year. I, I created it years ago. And, and you might be surprised that they're not all my books and some of my books aren't on there. So because what I care about, uh, more about selling books is about souls making progress. And some of my books are helpful, but not, I wouldn't put them central, you know, to what's necessary to grow spiritually. So this only contains, like I had limited space, you know, there's a huge number. I don't even know how many books there are in there. Yeah. And I'm trying to fit them all in and fit the most important ones in. And, you know, and some of mine got knocked off because like <laughs> I, you mentioned navigating the interior life, spiritual direction and the journey to God. When I wrote it, I wrote it because I couldn't find a good book on spiritual direction. I could find crummy books, 
that were mm-hmm. primarily focused on um, on uh, you know psychology and whatever, but not books that were really going to help people. Can, can I now, stop you on that oh, on yeah, that yeah. one on that book? So I'm I'm listening. I already have a spiritual director. I mentioned I I met him in in confession. He's been with me for a couple years now. Um, I. Chris Stefanik from Real Life Catholic said to me, you need a spiritual director. And I said, okay. So I blew it off for three weeks, three months. Sorry. I didn't even know what a spiritual director was. So if you, if you aren't sure of what a spiritual director is, this book will help you. Now I'm only into the third chapter and it's like, who, what is spiritual direction? What should I be looking for in a spiritual director? Uh, So for me, it's not really that applicable because I already have mine. But yeah. I think a lot of people, can you just give them a brief idea of what else is is in this book and why they should check it out? Yeah, well, so it, it helps you understand the one of the most powerful sections is this summary of the interior life and how you go from wherever you are to becoming a saint. So it gives you a framework to understand and to kind of get clarity about where am I now? What's the next step I need to take? And it can help you actually uh you know, find a director, know how to be a better directee, can help you assess where you are. So I wrote it because I was in direction like you and I was lost. I had a good director, but he was a wonderful holy priest, completely incapable of explaining to me what what this whole thing was about, what's what it is, what it isn't. So I went through, I don't know how many books, you know, Catholic books and historical treatments of it. And then I wrote it so that I would understand it. And then, of course, that's helped uh, a lot of other people. It was also a, a best-selling book. Um, it won the best book the year it came out. And it was the travesty is about that is it beats Pope Benedict's infancy narratives, which is a joke because his book is way better than my book. <laughs> but but I will say, you know, now there is an even better book on spiritual direction. And it's called Spiritual Direction, A Guide for sharing the Father's heart, and that's by my own spiritual director, Father Acklin, and then Father Boniface Hicks. So, so some on my list, I I can get now. Mine's good because it's great, you know, getting in through the door. But my list I created is more about what you need the most. And if somebody's book is right. better than mine, mine gets booted, and that one stays. Love it, love it. Okay, so let's go back. Let's shift gears again to sure. um, discernment of spirits. Can you give us another example in these times of what is yeah. going on? I kind of want to lean into what is going on, that there's yeah. a lot of division. And I think a lot of people are trying to discern the truth right. and what really is happening. So maybe you can help out with that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a big order. <laughs> it you know, is. It order. is. Sorry. Let, Sorry let, about that. Let's just say this. Um, Ignatius defines for us what is desolation. And then he says, you should always fight desolation. And guess what? He's exactly right. Yeah. So as you are you know, let's say, trying to figure out something in the world that's going on. If the news draws you to desolation, my advice to you is turn it off. If social (laughs) media brings you to desolation, my advice is turn it off. And here's, I'll guarantee you this. Uh, If you pick up good spiritual books, if you go to mass, if you go to confession, you're going to be relieved of those things because God doesn't draw, the enemy is what draws us to desolation, not God. Now, I will say, if you're going from mortal sin to mortal sin, that's the only exception. In that case, uh, the enemy gives you a false peace. You know, you know, you really love your girlfriend and, you know, you're always going to be together. Who needs marriage? You know, that's the enemy saying, oh, yeah, you're OK. And you have a false peace. But the, the good spirit's going to say to you, uh, no. Uh, you're abusing her. This is a daughter of the king. She deserves better than this. You should not be doing what you're doing without a ring. You know, you're taking advantage of her because she wants love. And, you know, so uh, in so when you're in rule number one, you're going from des- uh, mortal sin to mortal sin. The good spirit will make you uncomfortable, which, by the way, is contrary to popular teaching that if you have peace, it's God's will. It's not true. 
Right. It, there have to be other thing factors you have to do, you have to enter into. So if you're in mortal in sin, mortal sin, that's key. Yeah, yes. Yeah, th things flip. But if you're going from good to better, now when you're in desolation, if you engage in things that drive you that way, you need to stop doing that, because that's the that's God helping you understand. You know, this is not for you. One other thing is uh, during rule number five is probably the most powerful rule. And it's the one that people remember. I, I love Father Gallagher. I think he's the one in the, his book. He points out, he connects it to Galadriel and the Lord of the Rings, which is that elf princess, super powerful, you know, beautiful, all the good stuff. And she says to him, she gives him a little vial of light. And she said, this is a light that you look to when all other lights go out. Mm -hmm. And I love that application to rule number five. And rule, rule number five says that you never make a change to spiritual commitments you made in consolation when you enter into desolation. So if you make a spiritual commitment, let's say you listen to this show and you go, you know what, Kendra and Dan are right, and I'm going to get into the deep, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to start praying a half hour a day. What's going to happen is when the book arrives, you're going to get excited. Then the next morning as you go to read it, the enemy's going to go, you know what, you worked really hard last night, and you know, the kids kind of wore you out and, you know, your husband wasn't all as nice as he could have been. And you deserve a little rest. And your body goes, yeah, you deserve a little rest. You know, and the <laughs> devil says, so you listen to your body, you know. So that's desolation. And the enemy's trying to keep you from the good thing that he's calling you to do. And so rule number five says never, never, never make a change to your spiritual commitments you made at point A when in point B, you're in desolation. You have to wait to come back to consolation. Why? He answers the question in the rule. When you're in desolation, the voice of the enemy is very loud and powerful, and the voice of God is very distant and faint and doesn't have that power. And it's a time where you're supposed to fight. You fight through more prayer. So if, he said, if you commit to 15 minutes of prayer and, you're, and you enter into desolation, the answer is not to stop praying, it's to pray for 16 minutes. Right. Not 15. You need to say, you know what? Not only no, but heaven no. You know, I'm you, you're not taking any of my time and I'm coming against you. And that decreases the power of the enemy. And it actually may be oftentimes when I tell people to do that in that moment, desolation lifts that they make a decision because the enemy then flees because he doesn't have power. So that's another good, uh, good example. Rule number five is very powerful. I like to also, when those moments come, like my, I'm so tired, my eyes are ready to fall asleep. Uh, that happens to me every time I read. So I'm a big audible book girl. So yeah, that's yeah. why I always list, try to find ones that, that I can listen to. But some are really necessary to, to read so that you can write some things in the margins. Yeah. So uh, I always say, Lord, I offer up what my what the attack is on me. I'm either yep. lazy, I'm tired, and I offer it up through my body. Lord, I'm offering this to you, aligning it to you on the cross for all of those sleepy people walking around in the darkness who mm. are too tired or clueless about your love, sleeping in your in your world without you. Um, so I just always try to do something to offer it back up because it does help with bringing that consolation back to you and yeah. it gives you that spirit that spiritual lift and always say it out loud because the devil can't hear our thoughts so right. and then of course i go through the deliverance prayers and say in the name of jesus christ i bind the spirit of laziness or yeah. sloth or whatever it yeah. might be and i command you to go to the foot of the holy cross for jesus christ to pour his precious blood on you and to receive your sentence what do you what is your deliverance prayer how do you i know you have a little bit different uh, i use auxilium christianorum uh prayers we pray those daily which are prayers for of a community of people around the world who are in deliverance ministry or work with exorcists and that sort of thing so I use, I pray the Auxilium Christi Norum for the laity every day. My wife does the same. We also in our community have an approach to deliverance uh, and we call it liberatio, but it's it has to do with what you've done a bit of renunciation. If I can add something to what you said. Of course. When you follow what Kendra just said, and, and you should, it has a double effect. One, it 
it it can help bring you out of desolation it can give you strength but when let's say that that sleepiness wasn't was a an outside effect from the enemy which it can be when you fight against it and then you offer it up you're dissuading the enemy because what's happening is not only now are you being freed from what he was trying to do to you now you're using the suffering that you have against a broader plan that he has to affect so many other people which dissuades the enemy so if you think about the enemy is just like a bad guy trying to do bad things to you uh he's when his uh, when he does his uh, attempts to do a bad thing to you and it sort of blows up and all of his bad things he's trying to do to all these other people start to occur he's going to go whoa 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 wait a minute okay so <laughs> i i i'm not messing with kendra right now i'm going to go find <laughs> a better victim who will just go to sleep, you know, or whatever right. it is. So it's very right. powerful. And I'm not going to say I'm perfect every single no, right, time. Right. But I think I think that's why it's so important to do the studying and to learn the tactics of what is happening to us so that we can fight the fight, not go to the gunfight with a knife and truly um, actively participate in our spiritual development because it does require action. I mean, I know a lot of times it's, oh, surrender, and but we have to be, um, it's this actively docile <laughs> in, yeah. in receiving the, the graces, but also fighting uh, what's blocking those graces. And sometimes it's us and we just fall into that. Sometimes... I will go through that and I'm still reading. And before you know it, I, I've nodded off and then I say, okay, but that's not the right thing to do. It is to fight through it. Yeah. Read. If you were going to read that chapter, then read the, a chapter and a page. You're just, as you say, go that extra mile, no matter how hard it is, especially in mental prayer. A lot of people give up and they just go, that's actually a sinful behavior to stop your mental prayer and say, um, oh, I'm not into it. I'm not feeling it. Um, I, I keep, I, I better go put my grocery list together and you leave. So St. Francis de Sales says, if we just fight the whole time to keep our mind centered back on God and we get distracted again, the squirrel, the laser pointer of the cat and whatever it is, if we continue to fight all the way through our commitment, it's an, it's a good prayer. It, yeah. God takes that as saying, oh, you good and faithful servant, you fought through this because trust me. It will happen. We'll fight this until we are dead. And it's not, you know, I'm sure, Dan, you have those moments where you're like, I oh, I, I, just, I can't focus here, you know? Yeah, so no, yeah. uh, how about weekly, right? You right. Know, yes. Know, it's not, it's just, it, the catechism says prayer is a battle and there are no sissies who are people <laughs> of prayer. They just don't exist because yeah. it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, the, we do it because as you noted, not doing it is unjust. It's a, it's a violation of what is justly due to God, but also it's stupid uh, because it, right. why would you not? I mean, come on. How many people want to walk around in a lack of peace? How many people want to have a, a life that's a total mess? Well, if you draw near to Jesus, everything's not going to be fixed in a day. But I can tell you this. Every day that you're with him will be a better day than the day before. Every day that you're with him, whether you feel like it or not, you're going to make progress toward a holier life, a more peaceful life, a life more fulfilled uh, than than before. So uh, your admonitions to prayer are perfect and uh, everybody should listen. <laughs> so go back to the unjust. I think I haven't been um, that successful in, in finding the right words because we are called for, yeah. you know, you know the, the two greatest commandments. And the first one is to love thy God and yeah. to worship him. So how is it unjust when we don't? Yes. Yeah, so this is from St. Thomas Aquinas. So he speaks about religion and and what is rightly due to God. So we are his creatures. He brought us into this world for an eternal relationship of love. He sent his son to die for us. We, we owe him everything yet. It, and we can't even repay. We can't even in a in a true spiritual sense, even make up for one sin we've ever committed. It's not possible. Now, he by his blood, we can be forgiven and and by penance because of his grace we can in some sense but not in a true you know sense of the weight and the gravity of sin so we owe him everything and so uh, one of the things that aquinas teaches is that one of the things we owe him is every day to pray and as you said 
to fail to give him that that what is just and due to him uh, is is actually a sin. It's not a sin to struggle in prayer. It's a sin not to pray. Amen. Oh, the, I've, I've got to have you back. If I ever get oh, ditched by, by Christine and I'm stuck yeah. again, I'm going to I'd like to continue this because there's so much that we just have scratched the surface on. Sure. And I just want everyone to walk away and pray and learn how to pray, study. This is not a time to be complacent and just kind of sit and just say, hey, I believe in God and that's all I need to believe in because we are called to learn every day and we are going to fall every day and we're going to need to reach out to God to pick us up every day. Um, But we're also not meant to walk alone. So people are out there to help like Dan and all of the beautiful things he is doing in his ministry. And again, apostoleva.org and avalainstitute.com. Yeah, spiritualdirection.com. Yep. Oh, spiritualdirection.com. That is where you can go to the Divine Mercy radio podcasts Divine and listen to, yeah. Yeah. listen to all of those beautiful exchanges with him and Stephanie and um, go back to the ones on Discernment of Spirit that are available to you back in the tail end of December into the beginning of January. Don't forget, get the Into the Deep book to help you with prayer. Also, the um, spiritual warfare and discernment of spirits, because it's a daily fight, but yet we can prevail. Amen. We can prevail if we if we learn these tools, learn these weapons, learn these ways, and every day can be and should be that peaceful, peaceful day. All right, I will uh, wrap us up in prayer. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for bringing Dan to the Radio Maria world and all of those that are watching find your find something more find your way home on YouTube. I know that you want this information to get out to your children and for them to come closer to you to fight the fight every day surrendering their heart to you, being enlightened and also to have their lives be changed to bring the light to those around us. It's not just about deepening our relationship with you, Lord. It's about changing our lives and being more virtuous and helping those and loving those around us. And we can only do that with your graces because your transformation is the true transformation that all of us are seeking. The true peace, the truth, and the love that we are all wanting desperately in our lives every day. I would also like to thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing Dan. I know that so many prayers were out there when he was ill. I I pray that you keep him on this earth for many, many years to come. He is doing such great work for bringing people closer to your heart and walking that narrow path with you. I am more than delighted that you had him come on this show today. And hopefully we inspired others to make that decision every single day to pray and to fight for goodness and to be filled with the weapons, be filled with your love and to bring the light to the world. God bless you all. May you find something more and find your way home.